you know, I'm a scientist, I'm a PhD, my job is research. So you, people tend to think I am like, if it's not clinically proven, if there's no RCT being done, that don't use it. But it's, it's actually quite the opposite. It goes back to what I said a second ago. Evidence-based practice is not just science in terms of published peer-reviewed research. That's only a third of evidence-based practice. You're listening to the Restoring Human Movement podcast, where movement experts discuss the latest evidence-based practices to help you and your clients move with mastery. And now, your host, Dr. Sebastian Gonzalez. Hey guys, it's Dr. Sebastian Gonzalez. Thank you for being part of the Restoring Human Movement podcast with me. That was a snippet of the interview today with the great guest from Cal State Fullerton. He's a researcher at Cal State Fullerton in California, as well as a co-host of the Body of Knowledge podcast, which if you haven't heard, you really should. I think it's one of the best ones out there. Most informative, most non-biased, and extremely thought-provoking. So it's Dr. Andy Galpin who's going to join me on the podcast today through an interview. I, I really wanted to have this as... How can Andy from the research lab help us as clinicians to improve our current treatment? How, Just to make sure we're following what the actual science is dictating. And surprisingly, through this interview process, we kind of took a couple turns there. So we didn't go over exactly the things that we should be doing, but more so just some logic surrounding validating what we could be trying and what we could be doing. So there's a lot of storytelling in this. Um, it's more profound than the actual step-by-step of what we should be doing again. So listen to it. You're going to get a ton from it. If you're a clinician, if you're a DC, a PT, a ATC, probably a researcher too, as well as a strength coach or an exercise science major. Now, before we actually get into it, let me tell you a real quick story about myself that, uh, reveals that I am not a fan of of ET at all. And this came up recently because ET was kind of starting on the TV. I don't know why it was coming on. I don't think I've seen ET on the TV in a while, but either way, ET was coming on and I started realizing that ET is the, it was, is the worst idea to have a children's movie about an alien that screams, has glowing fingers and follows you up the stairs to steal your candy. It's a terrible idea for kids. So I was about probably six or so, I think when ET came around, I mean, my parents bought me this little E.T. doll, and he was probably about the size of, uh, I'm looking at my laptop right now, it's probably as, as tall as my MacBook Pro. So it wasn't very tall, but it had these little beady eyes, and it was green, I think, I'm colorblind. And it was in my room at first, and I just couldn't tolerate there. I was like, hey, you got to get this thing out of my room. I, I, don't, I can't sleep with it. It's staring at me. So they put it in the closet, and then I thought, it's in my closet. And you think about a monster being in the closet, and it's the worst place to put your E.T. doll. So finally I took it away and I think it went into the room and I haven't seen it for years and years and years. And just recently I heard that E.T. doll is still around. But either way, E.T., it's a bad idea. Bad idea for a children's movie. Let's get on to our interview with Dr. Andy Galpin. All right, everyone, welcome on Dr. Andy Galpin. Galpin? Galpin. Galp- yeah, wow. Galpin. You know, you guys do multiple takes of your show, don't you? Which one? Of your, uh, the Body Knowledge, the podcast. Uh, yeah, we, we, it's, that's extensively edited and retried and redone <laughs> stuff. So, so how long are you actually in the studio when you're doing that? Yeah, you know, I get this question all the time and it's, it's tough to say some of the episodes we've recorded six times. Dang. Um, some of them it's, it's kind of like one or two take. Well, generally when we have a guest, it's one take, but we'll record maybe like three hours and then that'll get condensed down to 45 minutes. But some of the episodes that, that we spend a lot of time writing, it's, you know, who knows? I I, can't, I wouldn't even be able to put how many hours go into the writing of the show. So. Well, it's it's a really good show, and I think you guys do actually a really good job of, um, I think, taking a, a good broad look at things and not being bashing like they saw on some podcasts and all that kind of jazz. So it's really good. I commend you for it. Thanks, man. That's generally what I tell people. Uh, it, it does very little to complain. Mm-hmm solutions are far more effective and and i also just do not believe even those that are trying to you know quote unquote make a name for themselves uh you, you might get there quickly by burning other people down but you don't stay around very long mm-hmm. so i mean certainly don't let people get away with murder if you feel like people are spreading things that are harmful but generally if the approach is instead of talking bad about other people you just 
simply talk about all the good some other people do. That's that's a better approach. Mm -hmm. And And I can tell your brand, if you will, as well as just life, man. I don't don't want that negative energy. I don't want that shit around me. Yeah, yeah. I can tell how empathetic you are too because of that dual camera thing we talked about earlier off air. You're looking at the camera when you're talking to me, not looking at my picture. (laughs) Trying to do my best, man. Yeah. Um, So I wanted to have you on today mainly to help educate clinicians, young clinicians, um, and, and I'm going to qualify them as not necessarily, not, not necessarily being uh, primary care physicians and whatnot. I like to think of them as trench doctors, the ones that are in the gyms and doing movement therapy and so on. Based upon what you kind of see with research, is all that kind of stuff passing through to us, or are there certain things that you'd like to educate us on to help our clients better? Well, the before we even get into that, I what I want to say is, how cool is the fact that we get to even do this? I know, right? <laughs> in terms of the fact that you're saying, hey, I'm talking to all those thousands of people who are clinicians in strength and conditioning facilities or whatever. Just the fact that that's even there still just gives me goosebumps. Mm-hmm. Technology. I mean, for all the strength and conditioning junkies like me, it's like, man, this is some of the things that we dreamed of. And we always complained that the athletic trainers were out of touch and the strength and conditioning coaches were just meatheads and the physical therapists, well, they were just completely completely out the left field as well. And, and now the fact that we have so many people that are, you know, a chiropractor and also strength coach and, uh, you know, speed coach and also a physical therapist. It's just so awesome. We, we just didn't have that in excess for a long time. And so now that we get that, it's like, man, you really got to take a step back before you start criticizing people now because you just don't know. Some people are really <laughs> talented. Yeah, yeah. But um, I- anyways, to answer your question, I think what you're really getting at is, is I mean yes and no. The it's difficult because of the expansion of knowledge. Um, you know, we went through this kind of golden area in research uh, probably five to ten years ago, where the amount of master's degrees and PhDs just exploded in the exercise science field. So because of that, the amount of knowledge and science available has it's not a linear increase; it's an exponential increase. So it's it is, I mean it's it's beyond impossible for the average clinician to keep up the science, if you will. And so, yeah, you're going to miss a whole bunch of stuff. But having said that, kind of like what I started saying, the integration of these fields, interdisciplinary approach has really solved a tremendous amount of that. So I really feel like as long as the clinicians are being involved in the field in a combination of things, so listening to podcasts, uh, attending professional conferences, getting out to seminars and clinics, uh, and reading occasional research, I honestly feel like that is by far the best way to get in touch with the bulk of the research that's relevant to you. So we can certainly talk about how science is misinterpreted sometimes in these fields, but on, that's my general answer to the question is, I, I think it is getting there. And, and if you balance out, you know, say research that, that I published out of my lab and what somebody like Kelly Starrett did, which is quote unquote not science at all, right? No publications ever. Well, I, I don't think, you know, as arrogant as I am, I don't think I can even remotely say that I moved the field a, a one millionth of as much as Kelly did. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, it's a combination. Evidence based practice is not just science, uh, it, it's multiple things, including your professional expertise or the expertise of others. So I, I do feel like the evidence, the field is definitely moving forward in terms of its evidence based practice, but. Whether or not that's science per se, yeah, yes and no, and I honestly, just don't think it matters that much. I, th- I think the field's doing great. Yeah. So as so as I'm as I'm catching this right, then you feel that being out in the field and interacting with the other professionals as well as athletes is helping more than actually getting into the minor nuances of what the research says. I think that's a that's one piece of it, most definitely. Um, interacting with other professionals. Uh, uh, you know, so not just going to your job at your practice, talking to your people that are in your practice and talking to your athletes. That's how you can be in trouble, most definitely. And so that is a good thing to do, of course. Putting those hours in the trenches is is critical. But then also poking your nose into the other things. Um, the Internet is good and bad, but ha- having some grip on it is really good. And picking up a book or two, going to a clinic, going to a national conference – I think if you do all of those things, you'll be in a very, very good spot. Mm-hmm. You, you brought up the, the Kelly Surrett thing. And actually, um, earlier I was I was speaking to a couple people on Facebook about something that I was, uh, or, or it was a topic of lower cross syndrome. 
and they were saying that there's there's no validating evidence for some of the things that we're using, but we're using them in clinical practice. Is I see you nodding your head, so you might as well just just you can say something right now if you like. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know where you're going with this, but I actually this is where I kind of trip people up a lot. I, you know, I'm a scientist. I'm a PhD. My job is research. So you, people tend to think I am like if it's not clinically proven, if there's no RCT being done, that don't use it. But it's it's actually quite the opposite. It goes back to what I said a second ago. Evidence based practice is not just science in terms of published peer reviewed research. That's only a third of evidence based practice. And this is a classic error. I think I just posted a, a few weeks ago about this. But the the cliche or the the funny saying is the absence of evidence which is what you just described, is not, in fact, evidence of absence. So what I mean by that is a lower cross syndrome, okay, great, just because there's no science on it, that doesn't mean there's science showing it's bullshit. Mm -hmm. Those are two entirely different things. And if anyone has done any time practicing in the real world, the vast majority of the decisions you make are going to be from the former, not the latter. Mm-hmm. Almost everything you actually do has never been actually scientifically tested. Now, if you're doing something that has been tested rigorously and continually shown to have low efficacy or effectiveness, then I'd say, hey, you you better have a real strong reason here, but it appears like you're going against the grain and, and that's not a smart idea. But the reality of it is individuals are so unique and we've started looking at even large subsets of, say, high school volleyball players female high school volleyball players. There's been virtually no research on that. Hmm. So what are you supposed to do with any of your treatments? Do none of them? Because what works for a high school volleyball player, female, is not necessarily true for how you would treat a college volleyball playing female. It wouldn't be 100% crossover, and it certainly wouldn't be crossover for a professional male rugby player. And I promise you, there haven't been that many studies that have have, vetted how should we best treat you know, uh, inversion ankle injuries across every gender, age group, sport, weight, training background. So because of that, almost every situation you're ever in in a clinic is is absence of evidence. There's just nothing. So mm-hmm. that, that that is kind of what I was alluding to when we first started when I said it, it, you, we can, if you want, talk about how science is misused. And that is a classic example of that. Um, just because it's not been shown it uh, doesn't mean it's wrong. So uh, I think in this case, this is when we can take a, a Mike Boyle and a, or whoever else is, is in these fields and uh, a Charmin, and you're like, you know what? Maybe some of the stuff isn't based on peer-reviewed research, but hey, it's, it's not going to hardly ever be. And there's some things like chiropractic in particular. Uh, it's You have two issues with chiropractic in terms of science. Number one, it's going to be virtually impossible to ever show chiropractic work will help mm-hmm. just because of the nature of pain. The ideology is not the same. So the reason you're in pain isn't the same. So there's almost no way you could ever show that the same treatment will, will reduce the pain. So you could put this through a thousand clinical trials if you want, and it's never going to show to work. But I promise you, the first time your back is thrown out and a, and a chiropractor pops it back in, you're going to be like, well, that shit worked. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it really worked, and which is different than just saying like, okay, all I do is show up pop, and they pop my back and that cures my cancer. That's, that's, that's the nonsense end. Um, and the other more diff, really difficult part about it is chiropractic in particular. I mean, if you're showing up and all they're doing is popping your neck, it's probably not going to do much. But generally in the chiropractic practices, uh, they're doing soft tissue stuff. They're doing uh, joint stuff. They're doing movement stuff. They're, they're doing a combination of treatment modalities. So they're not just popping your back or popping your neck. Um, therapists could be pointed the same thing. Therapists can now do manual adjustments. Mm-hmm. So it really depends. So when you boil it down to this, um, it, it gets to be as individual as the person treating you. So a good physical therapist or a good chiropractor is all the difference in the world. And there's too much variation in the practices. There's too much variation in methodologies. And there's way too much variation in the people that you're treating to almost ever be able to put science behind it. So you have to just be a little bit careful there. Mm-hmm. So that's interesting. Um yeah, you actually went exactly into the question there. So you read me read me well on that. Um, my I guess my question too with that is that with I keep thinking about syndromes like your IT band syndrome, your facet syndrome, and and people like coming in talking about these syndromes, and they they feel very strongly that's what they have, and then they seem to look at it <laughs> sure. under a microscope. Is I know there's multiple factors that can create things like this. 
when there's a multifactorial experience, is there any way to really prove or disprove that there's any? Go no, ahead. I mean, I think if, if there was, then we would have a lot higher efficacy and effectiveness of treatment. Yeah. Uh, but the problem is you don't. So we also have to think about, uh, I'm a junkie for logic. Uh, I just find it completely fascinating. And this is another primary example of a logical fallacy, which is fallacy of black and white. Right. And so we tend to, as humans, think better when issues are compartmentalized. So we'd like to think about a year being 12 months, and then we'd like to think about a month being 30 days and a week, seven days, and we break it down. And then that way I can organize my life such that Mondays I do this and Tuesdays I do that. But there is no thing in the universe that's a Monday. There is no Tuesdays. This is an arbitrary thing we called a Monday, right? So the same thing with IT band or any other syndrome, it's shin splints is the classic example from our heyday, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, hey, there, that is no such thing. There is no such thing as IT band syndrome. There's no such th thing as any of the other stuff that we call it. It's just a category of symptomology that we tend to help group together because people have found that, hey, generally, if they have this many symptoms, we, we generally treat it this way. We're getting more benefit or we're getting more or treatments being more effective. Mm -hmm. So that's all it is. So when someone comes in self-diagnosed from God knows where as <laughs> a certain syndrome, but even you as the clinician shouldn't be diagnosing those things uh, as an absolute. So yes, it's okay to say, hey, I think this is IT syndrome generally, so I'm going to treat it how I generally treat it, which is to do A, B, C, and D. That's fine, but you still have to think outside of that because, again, it, there is no such thing as those syndromes. It's just a category we arbitrarily put onto things yeah. to help us triage. It's really what it is. Um, I mean, I was fortunate enough to spend a part of my PhD in med school, actually. And I promise you, all they're learning is algorithms. Mm -hmm. And it's triaging. If you have this, this, and this, do that. If you have this, this, and that, do this. And, and it's just different things. And all that's nonsense. My, my professor, I was lucky because he was a, a PhD, not an MD. And so I'm in a room with 30 other to-be MDs, and I'm the only PhD, and I'm being taught by a PhD. And he continually hammered on them to not just memorize the algorithms like you have to fucking think like you really really have to think because physiology is too complex these algorithms are there to help you triage and give you what's most likely to work for most people most of the time but you still have to think outside of that because uh, there's no guarantee and if you think hard enough you're probably more likely to get to the right answer and save people time and save yourself time but if you just run the algorithms if an algorithm is correct 90 percent of the time that still leaves 10 percent of your patients screwed Mm -hmm. Well, if you treat a thousand people a year, that's a hundred people you just screwed because you were lazy. Yeah, so that comes down, I guess, to the the, the n is one, but yeah. but then totally. How do you get the how many how many of those how many of those um it was it was uh, MD school is that what it was med school yeah med school um how many of those came out actually with with that mindset of of considering the the entire system and not just the algorithm would you say oh probably none of them. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> well, in their defense, uh, they get hammered through a barrage of school, and you're not going to get through unless you learn to think like that because of the pace and the amount of information that they put on those kids. Mm -hmm. y you're going to have to think that. Now, hopefully, after they get out and they have a couple of years to get in the practice, they'll revert back. But uh, when you're in school, the honest answer is you, you have to play the algorithm game or you're dead. Yeah, yeah. So you have an interesting way of thinking of things I've, I've, I've noticed. Um, are you are you just are you just one person from a group of people that we usually don't experience, or are you do you go to bed thinking of these odd things and you wake up with the answer and stuff? Can you? Can you <laughs> I'm not sure what that question even means. Could you try to try that yeah. one again? I, I think I've, so. I've been listening. To you, I've been binge listening to your podcast and the. Um, you talk about how you. By the how way, you, I've done like probably I don't even know several hundred podcasts and interviews and stuff. Nobody's ever asked that ever or anything like that. So, <laughs> good job of asking me a question I've never heard before. Oh yeah, uh, well I actually don't. I love do I love doing these things mainly to interact with the people and like learn. I learn a little bit from them too. I mean, I learn a lot from you and your um, body of knowledge. But um, I, I really think that the people want to hear a little bit more entertainment. <laughs> yeah, fine. Um, but. So I hear you talking about how you interact with your wife and how she likes to be communicated a certain way, but you don't really communicate that way, but you blend it to communicate with her. So you're almost translating and digesting things down. So I'm just thinking about what's going on in your head, like when you're sitting in situations like that, where 
it's like you're thinking outside the box, and I just find it interesting. Yeah, I'd say a couple of reactions to that. Number one, there's almost always two conversations happening in people's heads. Uh, some of us are conscious of that second one, some of us are not. And so even right now as I sit here, I'm having the conversation with you, trying to answer your question in the most entertaining, insightful, and honest way possible. <laughs> but I'm also in my head having a conversation about, or thinking about the listener and thinking about, am I being insensitive to something else? Am I considering all possible options? Am I being as truthful as I am? Am I, am I being genuine? Could I have answered something better? Uh, those are all going on in people's heads. And so the more you can be conscious of both of those things, I think communication can be dramatically improved. How do you think someone can improve their ability to, to tune into that? Since clinicians just, are doing this all the time, they should be. Yeah, just like anything else, it's practice. It's practice and being mindful and aware. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's just going through that time of when you're speaking to your patients. Uh, the way that I put it is, um, if you've ever watched, I'm a big MMA fan. I work with a lot of fighters in the UFC. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever watched the UFC interview where, you know, after the fight, they interview the winner. And so the winner stands in the cage with Joe, with Joe Rogan, and Joe Rogan asks the winner, you know, him or her some questions. And if the person is not English-speaking native, they have a translator there. And so what's always funny is you see Joe asks a question, and the athlete takes four minutes, and they're spouting off something in Portuguese or Japanese or whatever. And four minutes go by of him or her talking, and then the translator turns back to Joe and says, oh, he's really thankful, and uh, well, thank you, Chicago. <laughs> so what's happening there is, is that the translator was having two conversations in, in his or her head. It's what did the athlete say, and then what do I need to say to get the point across? And so you take all that four minutes information, and he distills it down to what Joe Rogan and the audience really wants to hear. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what I'm talking about. So in this particular case, you are your own translator, and so... I always like to say, don't kill motivation with information. Mm -hmm. So make sure you're giving your clinicians uh, or, your, or your clinicians, your patients, the information they need to know to get, know to get better. Not all the information that you want to show them you have so you feel smarter. Mm -hmm. so, and and that's, that's something you have to be very, very careful of. Effective communication doesn't mean telling them everything you know. It might, effective communication might be, I want you to do this stretch. Why? Because I fucking said so. <laughs> and that might be a fantastic answer for one person. And then table over, you might have the exact same prescription and have to go do this stretch. And they say, why? And then you have to go into a three-minute detail about how the hip is articulated and, and um, you know, what the research shows on connective tissue and changing range of motion. And that might be perfect for that person. And so that's really what you have to do is you have to, number one, have the conversation in your head, which is thinking about the information, thinking about the answer. But then you need to have a second conversation, which is how do I effectively communicate this with that person? So that's really what I'm talking about. And again, that all just comes down to practicing that. Mm -hmm. It's um, going back to that syndrome idea. Then is it is it is it better in the future for our future to dis debunk that syndrome or that false belief that they have, or just keep letting them believe it and just tell them what to do? <sighs> So that's a really good question. And the story I can give you is everybody in my family is obese. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I've tried for oh, decades to help everybody and I've tried a whole bunch of things and it's never worked. Uh, with the exception of my brother, the rest of them have never, ever lost a pound. They've just gained weight over time. Well, just last year, my dad got excited about, you know, diet again. And he said, hey, I read this book on Atkins. And I'm like, great. And <laughs> traditionally, I would have then interjected about what's the research show on carbohydrate, and et cetera, and basically that you don't have to stop eating carbohydrates to lose fat. But the, for the first time in my life, of, you know, eight months ago, I just decided to shut up. And I knew that a lot of the information he's telling me was just scientifically wrong. It failed basic logic. It failed evolutionary biology. It failed teleology. It just failed logic on every level. But I was wrong. And this is typically what uh, a lot of people refer to as a metaphorical truth. So this is something that is wrong in principle, but ends up causing the right action. Mm -hmm. And so I just shut up and I said, oh, yeah, those carbs, they're, they're terrible for you. They're going to kill you. <laughs> and I didn't do anything. And he just all of a sudden got way more conscious about his diet. He started reading other things. He was just really excited every day. He was excited about his dietary changes. And 
It wasn't the best diet ever. It was not great, actually, but he was excited about it. And so I just let him get excited for a while. And I started sending him books and stuff. And he would read them and he would read other things. And he was really, really motivated. And prior to that, every single time, I had killed his motivation by giving him information and for being a, a negative Nancy, basically. Mm-hmm. And just putting him in a spot where he would be excited about something and then I would crush it. And he'd be excited and I would crush it. And I just decided to stop and I let him have some success. And all of a sudden, he lost 20 pounds. 30 pounds, 40 pounds. And then things go by and and he was so excited. And all of a sudden for a guy who's been on extensive acid reflux um, uh, prescriptions his entire life started coming down way down on that. He's taking Advil or painkillers every day for, I don't even know how many years started coming off of that. He went completely off his blood pressure pressure medication simply because he was losing so much weight. And then he would get really excited and would say, hey, you know what we should really do is maybe you should start adding some, because basically what he would do is eat steak and eggs in the morning, he'd eat a hamburger at lunch and, or a protein shake, and then you'd have some other sort of meat in the afternoon and then have like some canned beans or some canned carrots or something, which is far from ideal. But then I would say, okay, great. So that, that protein shake you're doing, what if we put some cantaloupe in it and some flax seeds? Okay, I think I can do that. And then... That's it. And he did that and for a month, and all of a sudden, boom, he's like, I can't believe how much energy I have. I feel unbelievable. It's the most energy I've had in 20 years. And another month go by, and then I started saying, well, why don't we start replacing these canned vegetables with some frozen ones? Okay, I can do that because there's no more prep time, and I'll have to learn to cook. And then just slowly, after months or so, I would give him a few more and more things, and we're still not even close to where I think he should be in terms of a nice, well-balanced diet. But it, symptomology-wise, it's, he's so much better, and he's still super excited about it, and he continues to lose weight. And so the reason I tell this story is to go back to exactly what you're saying. I think sometimes it's very hard. You really have to, to try, and I generally think education is better. So getting people the right information is where we want to go. But sometimes you do have to just be like, you know what? You can keep believing in this wrong thing, but you're doing the right thing. And so for now... I'm going to let that roll. Um, And Mm -hmm. I don't know where that line falls between his letting the wrong information out there and correcting it. But all I know is when I finally shut up for a minute after 15 (laughs) years, he finally started making changes. So I think it's a very difficult thing to, to, um, to broach. But, you know, I, I say this um, a lot now that I was, I was with the Marie Spano, who's the nutrition or dietitian for the Atlanta Hawks and, um, the Falcons and I think maybe another professional team in Atlanta. But she said a couple of years ago at a conference, she said, look, when an athlete walks into my office and he is very excited about making a nutrition change, I want to keep that momentum. And so even if she doesn't think he's on a great diet, she says like, I'm on his team. I'm not here to show him how much smarter I am than him. I'm here to help him get better at what he wants to do. And so she's like, I will always support the diet as long as it's, even remotely reasonable and I'll just help him do it better because I want him to succeed. I don't want him to fail and then come back to me, which is another major, major, major mistake early practitioners make. Um, you don't, you shouldn't want them to fail so that they can come crawling back to you and they can tell you how much smarter you are. You should take what be able to take what they're doing and have them succeed in spite of that. If you do that, mm-hmm. they're going to get much more buy-in and they'll come back to you and say, Hey, this was, this was a great idea. Thanks for helping me here. What do you think I should do next? Or how should I, how can I make this even better? And according to Marie, she always says, like, if you do that, eventually, a couple of months go by, or it might take a year, you can get them on a diet or plan or program, whatever, that you think is best. But you, you probably can't do that initially. So, mm-hmm. again, a long answer <laughs> to that question, but it's, it's <laughs> a really, really difficult one. I don't think you can just have a straight answer, which is do this or that. Um, it, it kind of reminds me of so, when uh, you guys interviewed Brett Bartholomew with conscious coaching. Is there's totally you get a you just picking kind of what the person will accept and what will make them better, and then just kind of interject little parts along the, on the, along the, along the way. It's a very similar thing to what he tries to do with his his coaching language, um, and, and people have been doing this stuff for for as, as long as I think we've been working with people. <laughs> but it's just uh, now acknowledging the fact that. And especially when you get out of school, when you first graduate, you're so excited to show people how much smart, how smart you are. Cause you spent this 10 years and $300,000 in school 
like you you want to share the damn information with somebody but it may not be the most effective way <laughs> right um hopefully this is a question you haven't been asked yet either uh what's the most effective way to kill fruit flies because i really do want to know this right now most effective way to kill fruit flies yeah well how come they don't get attracted to actual light beer they get attracted to stouts i have absolutely no idea <laughs> i drink my beer way too fast for that to be a problem well, I try to empty out a little bit, just like pour some out for the homies, because I, I recognize mm. if I'm if I'm going to do a stout, I, I need to kill some fruit flies. Ugh, I own, I, I'm i only going to pour out malt. That's the only way. <laughs> if you're going to pour some for the homies, it's going to have to be malt. <laughs> Colt 45? Well, that'll work. Have you done an MD, or have, have you done a King Cobra before? <sighs> Probably. Um, I try to bury as many of those memories out of my head. One of the worst ones ever, <laughs> man. So in college, I went to did my undergrad in a small school in Western Oregon, about an hour and a half or so south of Portland. And every Friday were what they call the dock sales. And so you could drive up to the docks, and they would have these huge pallets of cases of beer that they would sell for like five dollars a case or less. But you never know what was going to be there. And so often on Fridays, we would go up there with as many cars as we could. We'd drive separately, and we would literally. And I mean literally fill our car with beer. We would just take as many cases as we could get, and then we would actually have a house parties where the whole house was just cases of beer. And we would charge like $5 all you could drink, and no one generally on average can drink a full case of beer. How would you refrigerate it? So some we would just keep it, you know, we had several fridges going, and then once we noticed when going out, you just kind of rotate them back in. But after that many beers, people don't really care. Right. <laughs> didn't go that much all the furniture was cases of beer we would make like chairs and sofas with ca- beer cases and put pillows and stuff over it we would do all that and one time one of the major uh we went up there and there was i think only two beers that they had up there one of them was called nirvana mm-hmm. and it was kind of like a smirnoff kind of thing oh gross <laughs> oh horrendous <laughs> and the other one was called i think something like big bear and it was like imitation Colt 45 or Old English or something. That must have been a theme party you had this time then. Oh, my <laughs> God, no. But it was just, I mean, you're up there thinking, like, what am I going to do? Drink imitation malt liquor or Smirnoff? Oh, well, you, pro- well, you the probably girls were happy, but. You didn't hide them around Oregon and uh, start to ice people just randomly. There's probably still bottles of Nirvana sitting around. <sighs> no, I think I'm sure I'm probably sure they all got drank real fast. Yeah. I don't know, but that's just, yeah. I don't, so, they don't have no anything like that down like here. Oh, <laughs> well, I don't even know if we do. We probably do, but I wouldn't know. That's I don't miss those days at all. Yeah, so, the, they're not coming back anytime soon. Uh, can you tell everyone about your your podcast you guys put on? Because I do, I think do think it's extremely well formatted, and I, I I've shared it with quite a few few of my clinician friends, and I think we learn a lot from it. Can you tell us about the body knowledge? Yeah, sure. Thank you. And I appreciate the opportunity. So that's, um, you know, I, I had the opportunity and sort of been asked to do a podcast, my own show for a, quite a long time. And I just didn't want to do it because I don't want to contribute to the noise. You know, no offense, but <laughs> I, I don't think I, you're doing that. But there's just so many people have podcasts and I don't think they really have anything original to say and et cetera. And it kind of clouds everything. And so finally I got talking to do it with my friend, Kenny Kane, who's a former, professional stand-up comedian so he used to tour country headline kind of guy played with all the names you can think of he played with and he's also been a strength conditioning coach for about 20 years was a division one athlete himself so uh, along with our other person josh Embry, who's a phd in statistics and, and human behavior so i thought it was actually sort of a nice combination of the three of us because we can kenny can really speak to to really training people he's trained professional athletes and a whole bunch of general population folks and you know i'm a scientist and, and josh is a scientist but in a whole different realm of human behavior and and so we thought well well we can do this but the format i want to be different and as you can sort of tell i'm a storyteller mm-hmm. so i wanted to be able to tell stories and not just have to be like it's tuesday and we got to get our show up on tuesday and we got to get three up a week so let's just go and talk about some bullshit so we spend an exorbitant amount of time on those. We've the, we've had the show for a couple of years now, and we've only put out two seasons. And I think we haven't put an episode out in nine months or something. 
and we don't have anyone in the works. But mm-hmm. really, it's it's been two seasons so far. The first season was centered around change. So what we do is each season is uh, eight or so episodes, and we we tell a story that runs central through every single episode. And in the first season, the theme was change, and we started with the smallest change possible. And so the first episode was really about all the molecular and cellular changes that can happen with exercise and muscle. We worked our way up to the human organism, to the coaching scale, and all the way up to the national scale about how do we make long-term changes in policy across the nation, across 350 million people. And so sometimes we bring in guests that can speak uh, authoritatively on topics, and sometimes it's just ourselves, and um, we don't put out content to, to put out another post. We we spend a lot of time writing every episode. They're heavily edited, and we make sure that they are doing exactly what we want to do. All the stuff that goes behind the scenes to writing a TV show or something, but uh, just takes way too much time. So that first season was out. The second season was about Sherpas. So these are people that lead you to change. So people that lead you up the mountain tell you that, hey, maybe this is not the right mountain for you. Maybe today is not the day to climb. And those also that help you come back down from the mountains. So those two episodes, those two seasons are out. And uh, we are in discussions, if you will, to potentially do a third season. (laughs) What would the third one even be, you think? Well, oh no, we know. Um, We know, actually... So before we even put down the first episode, we sketched out all nine seasons. Nine seasons, wow. So we have a nine-season arc. And again, we, we wanted this whole thing to make a tremendous amount of sense. Um, we did the whole nine-season thing thinking that we may only do one season. We may do two, six, I don't know. But if we do this the right way and we do it, well, I want it to just be something that was thought of ahead of time and constructed and not just making up as where we go. So... We have a very clear path for all nine, and all nine seasons will make sense on top of each other. There will be a thread that runs through all of them, but we know season three. I'm just not going to release it yet. (laughs) Fair fair enough. Because we have to, the honest answer is we have to build the whole season. We write the whole season, every episode, all of it, before we record anything. Yeah. To make sure it all lines up and syncs the way we want it to be. So I know it takes an incredible amount of planning. There There was at one point I tried to do four of the same topic related podcast in the same month mm-hmm. as well as same videos. And that lasted about two months. I just could not do <laughs> it was, I, I got distracted and I'm like, this is, this is not going to happen here. It's very difficult. Yeah. I actually enjoyed the the recent one with Lee Brown. That was a oh, yeah. very inspiring individual. He's the man. Um, you know, I just actually just exchanged some comms with him this morning too. I still love the guy to death. What's actually sort of funny. One of the funny things about our show is, We've had an eclectic group of people. So, you know, Kenny and myself, we know a lot of celebrities and big name folks, and we have intentionally not reached out to many of them because we didn't just want it to be a show where it's like, look how many famous people we know kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so we wanted to, like, for example, with the Sherpas season, we wanted to talk about leadership. And so I didn't want to just bring in the most high profile leaders that we know. But really, we wanted to talk about it from a 360-degree perspective, which is there's leadership in many forms and facets of life. And so in that season, I think we talked to Lee Brown, who is, uh, if you're not familiar with the name, he's arguably one of the most productive sports scientists of all time. But we also had uh, high school teachers on there, and we had um, you know, a couple of celebrities, uh, and we just had some other things. So we wanted to really show people what leadership looks like in all forms and facets of life, some military folks, some other things. So we did the same thing with season one. And we had Jack Osborne on. We had Brett Bartholomew before he was, you know, Brett Bartholomew. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we also had some people that, Mike Mike Michael Evans, who you've you've never heard of before and and most people never have or never will. So um, we have some people lined up for season three, but I I, I can't uh, can't announce (laughs) those yet either. Well, I, I definitely enjoyed the uh, going into the Sherpa one. Right now, I'm actually partway through the uh, the sex ed one. Didn't finish ah, yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was it was. I had a couple teachers come in as patients, and I was at, I was asking because the school you're starting right now, and they were so excited to be able to take these kids through this journey. And I kind of took a step back and like look at the people that I work with here at the clinic, and 
we kind of have jumpers sometimes. You might not see them more than twice. or mm-hmm. So we don't really have the opportunity to plan things out nor see the development of them. But it's a very one-way relationship. And I was like, I'm really jealous of you guys. You got them, you got them held up for like three months. Mm-hmm. So good, th- good thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have the same issues. Sometimes uh, most of the kids that I interact with, I get for one class. And even my grad students, I only get for two years. And I don't have PhD students or anything like that where I could really mold. And uh, But the same thing happens with my athletes, too. Mm-hmm. You know, even if I've had them for a long time, they... They'll check out for months at a time because they go out of camp or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, all right, hard for me to make these long-term changes when I, you know, only time I hear from you is six weeks before a fight. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, it's tough. Well, I think that actually does go to the, uh, I wrote down one of you guys' quotes in there, evidence plus humans equals fitness. Yeah. And I think, uh, is that the human part right there? They're just, uh, they're in control of their own destiny? Well, that's a big part of it. It's a very <laughs> expensive thing but that is a huge part of it it's it's everything though it's um you know it's the social interaction it's the it's the environment it's the language that you shape it's the culture it's it's all of those things that go into be these really complex beings that we call human Mm -hmm. so the the joke uh or the the way i always say is uh, sam harris got pretty famous for saying and many others have now echoed that that you know they're confused of why we got people we sent people to the moon 50 years ago you know, we had the technology and the science to land people on the moon 50 years ago, but somehow we haven't figured out what's healthy or not healthy to eat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and my answer is, you know, Sam, look, it actually makes complete sense because human beings are far, 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 far more complicated than space. The variables are constant in space. There is no wind. There is no air. Nothing changes. I can. There's only a handful of things I have to know and there's no difference if i only had to count for four variables in a human being (laughs) like that'd be the easiest day of my life Mm -hmm. so interacting and making change in people is i mean you've already heard some snippets of it as we've gone along it's not just about knowing what how many carbohydrates to eat or what stretch to do or or how to activate a a glute like that that's just a very small portion of what you actually have to do to make a change in somebody so Mm -hmm. it's a very complex thing and anyone who's an expert in say physical therapy might be using the wrong cues or they might be talking to the person poorly because they're not a sports psychologist and maybe a highly trained sports psychologist isn't affecting performance because they actually don't know how to train a person Mm -hmm. they don't know how much to do and a highly trained strength conditioning coach could be terrible at both those other things so you can't be an expert in all of them and so it's just a challenge we all have to battle but i think at least recognizing those other disciplines are critical Mm -hmm. Um, and as you well, you generally see the arc of most coaches is they come into, say, strength and conditioning coaching, being very excited about the periodization and rep ranges and intensities, and they almost all leave talking about sports psychology. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's almost always how it works out. Yeah, that makes complete sense. We, we kind of see the same thing in ours, too. I think it's all uh, back to the, the N is one thing. And yeah. it, it's all individualistic. Who's going to take what cues and what, who won't, you know? Um, I want to be respectful of your time. I think we're hitting about 45 minutes here. Is is there anything you'd like to cover still or tell us ways to contact you? Uh, no, I mean, um, I'm out there. It's pretty easy to find. You can certainly check out my website, which is just my name, andygalpin.com. So the podcast is up there. The podcast is all on iTunes and everything else that's available. You know, the social media, um, you know, I'm up on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, and that's pretty easy to find all of those things. But with the website, what I do is take as many of my classroom lectures, uh, speaking gigs, things like that, and I put them all up on my website for free. Mm-hmm. So I've got three different things. I've got what I call five-minute physiology, which is the condensed version, 25-minute or 55-minute things. And so Uh, I tend to look at and I teach things differently. So, for example, in my classes, I don't teach. uh, You won't see a syllabus that says uh, neuromuscular system, then cardiorespiratory system, and skeletal muscle. I I don't teach that way at all. I teach uh, systems-based things. So you'll see a section on hypertrophy. And I'll talk about all the things in the body necessary from immune to muscle to performance to hydration, etc., I'll go to the next outcome. So I teach an outcome-based uh, criteria, um, hmm. 
material rather than uh, systems based. Because I actually think that makes people worse. Uh, I, I think it does people a huge disservice to teach the system by system approach um, because the body doesn't work like that. Cool. Oh, so, I do see it. The body of knowledge, the five minute, 25 minute, 55 minute physiology. Yep. Dig it. Cool. I did see and a YouTube video YouTube recently. Too, so you can just subscribe to the, the YouTube page or whatever that's up there. But those videos are free. They're always free. There is a Patreon account attached to that if um, if you you know want to contribute a buck or two. And <laughs> Buy what I copy. do there is um, I actually have some students that help me with uh, writing out the notes for it. And what I want to do is all those videos I want to turn into like really short written version of it for people that don't want to watch the whole video or there as well as study questions if anyone wants to use it in their classes and stuff. And so all the money that is donated every single penny uh, on the Patreon account i give to my students to help them put that stuff up there cool. so i don't i don't i haven't taken never will take a penny from that stuff so um if you see some value there and you want to contribute to the patreon page that's great but if not um yeah you know, these kids will just keep eating for a couple bucks so. well you got you got amazing work so um thanks for sharing everything and thanks for being on um but i don't know how everyone's gonna recognize you without your facial hair actually <laughs> <laughs> well, it just depends, man. It's it's all over the board, depending on the day, depending on how many days Natasha has let me grow it out. <laughs> your your beard is in a in a constant state of adaptation. Yeah, it is. Really, she let me get away with a full beard a couple of times. Once because I, I try to pull it like this. I'm like, hey, it's uh it's winter time. I need to get a winter beard. And then she'll usually let that slide for a few weeks. And then I'm like, well, it's springtime, so I got to get a spring beard. <laughs> And then it's summer beard. And then I was on sabbatical one time. And then I got to have a beard for hunting season. So each one of those usually gives me about a week or two. And it takes me about seven months to grow a beard. So two or three weeks in, it looks pretty just ridiculous. And kind of like a 12-year-old boy trying to grow a beard that is missing half his facial hair or something. So well, it's all right. that's it why gets they, pretty gnarly. That's why they make colored marker. You're okay. Yeah. I just don't care. <laughs> Well, right on. Well, thank you so much for being on. That was uh, it was great. I think a lot of people are going to learn a ton from this. I hope so. It was my pleasure to be here. Yeah, man. Nice. Okay, thanks so much, Andy, for being on. Everyone, that was Dr. Andy Galpin. Uh, if you're looking to contact him or find his content, go on to his website, andygalpin.com. That's A-N-D-Y-G-A-L-P-I-N.com. That's where you can find the Body Knowledge Podcast if you're not already looking on iTunes, as well as uh, 5, 25, and 55-minute physiology, which I started into a little bit, and I thought it was really nice the way he's putting it together. So very easy to follow. I felt like I was back in school again. It was amazing. So thanks so much, Andy. I, I know you're a busy, busy guy, so that was amazing to actually be on, too. Now, if you guys are looking for the show notes on this, go to p2sportscare.com. You can type up Andy Galpin or just go on to the show number, which I think this one is going to be uh, 106. So just go into, the, go into the search bar on the first page, type up 106 or Andy Galpin, you'll find the show notes. And anything that we spoke about the, in this um, podcast that is link-related or if you're looking for some things that you just couldn't catch, there's a written form in there too. So just like always, review the podcast. Tell me what I need to get better at. Tell me what uh, people you want me to interview. Tell me what words and ums and pauses I need to stop using because I'm really working on that this year still. So I'll talk to you guys soon. Remember, leave people better than how you found them. And date in Eagle Scout. Talk to you later.